Good evening, fun seekers. I'm Mark Evanier. If you've never seen one of these before, what you're looking at is a webcast from uh, my office in Los Angeles. Uh, during the pandemic, I decided it'd be fun to talk to people I haven't talked to enough in my life or people I wasn't going to see at the conventions they're not having. So each week on Tuesday nights, I talk to a friend of mine. I let you listen in. Uh, a little later, we'll be taking questions in the chat room. But for right now, let's just say hello to my friend, Peter David. Hello, Peter. Hi, where are the artists? Isn't this quick draw? <laughs> no. Was, you know, people kept saying to us, why don't you do quick draw online? Why don't you try, like, you know, you put, I put the cartoon voices panels online. And <laughs> I said, I, you know, and this one guy sent me this long, huge email about how to, the technical end of doing it, of having, like, you know, cameras in Sergio's house and cameras in mine and cameras at Scott Shaw's mm -hmm. and cameras are a guest and doing had one camera on each of these people so they we could see them and then one we could see so that they were drawing and then we have to use all sorts of split screens to match put the drawing side by side and all oh, this Jesus. and the whole thing and it just convinced me we couldn't do it. No. And then I wrote back to the guy and said, Okay, now how do we hear the audience laughing? Yeah. <laughs> That's Which, the thing. I mean so much of what makes quick draw something for those people who are unaware, Quick Draw is the panel that uh, Mark does every year at San Diego, along with what 12, 13 panels that you do? Uh, usually 14, yeah. And he basically has three artists uh, Sergio Aragones, Scott Shaw, and a rotating artist who basically sit there and they have to draw to the specifications of the things that Mark gives them. Why, why don't you give a an example? Well, like, of, like sometimes I, I, I ask them to draw themselves in a funny situation, or sometimes I ask them to give me a commentary on something in the news, or sometimes we do a thing like, you know, we, we take suggestions from the audience of a male cartoon character and a female cartoon character and say, you know, if these two had a child together, what would it look like? What would Betty Boop and Superman's kid look like? You know, yes. and they have to draw that. And we do different things. And we have a game we play, which Peter has been involved in a couple of times. I have. Called Secret Words. <laughs> God. And, and the way it works is that we I get someone out of the audience. Peter has been the, the contestant, what, about four times, I guess? Four Something or five like times. that, yeah. And I show the audience and I show the cartoonist three words. Everybody sees the words, except for, in this case, Peter. And the cartoonist had to do drawings that will convey the word to Peter. It's like password. It's like it's based on drawings. And you look at the drawing and you guess what the word is. So um, one year, um, do you, why don't you tell the story about, about the time you and Sergio played a trick on me? Do you remember this? Oh, God. Sergio uh, decided to... Vaguely. Sergio, vaguely. okay. Uh, usually, I give the words out, and then we... do. Sergio said, suddenly says to me, in the, as we're doing as we're doing uh, quick draw, he says, Mark, I want to try a word, see if I can convey it to Peter David. And Peter was in the front row or up close, and he got yeah. Peter up there. Peter was in on this. And Sergio writes out the word avuncular. Avuncular, that's right. That's right. And the idea was, you know, and everybody laughs because I, my God, how do you convey avuncular? And Sergio, I'm sure did, half the people didn't know what avuncular means. No, no, no. I'm avuncular not sure. means uncle like. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I'm not sure Sergio knew. <laughs> even, no. But uh, and he's watching this. Hi, Sergio. I'll talk to you after this. So um, uh, he drew like one petal of a flower, and Peter guesses avuncular. Yes, and the audience gets hysterical as of this. Now I had had in my little toolkit of things a for emergencies i had a special envelope of words that i decided oh okay they played a trick on me i'll play a trick on i can't play it on sergio but i'll play a trick on peter um the words usually the the, 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 the words and there's three words and it will say something like you know green no 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 no, no, no. Uh, I, yeah, yeah i think you misremember as i recall i know the words you're talking about that was I was in direct competition with Len Wee. No, no, that's another time. You're 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 merging two things. This is the first time we 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 played tricks on each other here. Oh, okay. Usually, usually there's three words that say like green, right. uh, uh, chicken, and you know, and, and uh, angry. Repulsive. Okay. Right. And this one, it said there are there's no words here. Just draw anything. Oh, so right. so 
the cartoonist, and I'm now doing all these drawings that don't relate to one another. Yeah. And, you know, Sergio is drawing a duck, and Scott Shaw is drawing a vampire, and the other guy was drawing, a, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> yeah. whatever it was. And Peter suddenly is staring at this thing with no pattern, no co no cohesion, no no coherence to it. And do you remember what you, what you were thinking then? You were thinking... This seems oddly random. <laughs> yes, seems strangely random to me. Yes, and it took him a few minutes. The audience was quite uh, it was enjoyable to this. Yes. So then, a, a year or two later. Oh, okay. This is where we, I was we were doing a a, a, um, a contest. It was Len Wein who had played the game a lot versus Peter. Yeah. And we had a we did a round with Len, and we did a round with Peter, and, and the, the audience, audience got to vote. The audience got to vote who was the winner, and they picked Peter. So Peter got to do the. And I'm round. sitting there begging them to pick Len. <laughs> yes, which is why the bastards okay. went for me. So I'm going like, gee, thanks a freaking lot, guys. So the cartoonists were Sergio, Scott Shaw, and Bill Stout. Yes, and I remember all this stuff. And yeah. the 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 three words when they went up were cat, cat, dog. dog. And miscellaneous. Miscellaneous. <laughs> so yes. the audience gets hysterical because right. they go, well, we're going to be here for days. I mean, yeah. you know, and so now everybody, the cartoonists all start drawing a cat. And Peter is baffled because it can't possibly be that simple. Yeah. And he finally, like, hesitantly goes, cat? cat? <laughs> and everybody goes, yeah, great, terrific, nice job. Great, Peter. Okay. Now... Everybody starts drawing, and before there's a line on the page, Peter goes, dog? dog. And everybody yeah, goes, Fine. I got, got that. Got it instantly. Okay. I was very proud right. of myself. Okay. I got. I was very proud of myself because I yeah. got that before Sergio drew anything. Yes, that's right. You did. And, okay. you know, so I thought if I could actually beat out Sergio, yeah. I, have, I should, should be really proud of that. Because Sergio, for those who don't know, is quite possibly one of the fastest artists on the planet. Yes, Sergio is, is lightning fast. And the interesting thing about Quick Draw, one of the interesting things about Quick Draw, which of course was kind of a device to show off the skills of Sergio, um, is that he will start in, in improv? Peter, did you ever take an improv acting class? You yes, I have. Say, okay, in improv acting, which I have taught occasionally, um, we kind of teach you to start talking without knowing where you're going. Yes, because in real life, you don't. You know, if Peter asks me a question, I don't sit there, think of my answer, and then reply. I start talking and reply to him and begin thinking. And I'm thinking as I'm talking, or maybe I'm not thinking at all. So in improv comedy, we teach you to just get into the character and start reacting. And right. then a joke will emerge. So I'll see Sergio start drawing. And then I'm watching him draw. And I can he's halfway through the drawing, and he doesn't know what the joke is yet. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I can see the drawing, the, the, the joke pop into his head. One time, I asked him to draw himself as Batman. And he starts drawing Batman with a, with a Sergio mustache and a flabby body. And, and, he's, and he, he doesn't know where he's going with it. And all of a sudden, he gets down to the utility belt. I saw his face light up. And he starts drawing fountain pens on the utility belt. <laughs> well, of course. Yeah. And, of and, course. And the audience, it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating to watch. See, I'm out in the audience working with the audience. And I'm listening to them sure. and watching their faces. And... Um, and, and this is, I'm one, I know I'm wandering away from the story here, but one of the things that is fascinating to me, um, I am, you know, I'm a magician, not an not a accomplished one, but I, I have a background in magic. And I'm a member of the Magic Castle here in Hollywood. Ah, I've and, been and to the you, Magic Castle. It's a yes, great place. Yes. And when you watch magic, sometimes at the castle, you look at the audience and you're seeing this look which essentially is, no, no, I didn't just see someone do that. That's not, no, no, I, my eyes have deceived me. I didn't yes. see that happen. And then in the quick draw is usually followed by the cartoon voices panel. And I see that look there where people are going, no, no, I didn't just hear that man sound exactly like Christopher Walken. No, I didn't hear that woman sound like a duck. I right. didn't hear that voice coming out of a human being. And in this quick draw, we see the same thing because people are sitting there watching these brilliant cartoonists who were very fast. And you see that same look of, no, no, 
I can't believe what I just saw. And people are afraid to look away because they're going to miss that moment when the joke appeared. Yeah. Because the cartoonists all know instinctively, I don't have to tell them this, to, to add the funny part at the end. You know, it, it, there's a, a drawing, they do a drawing, and they hold off as long as possible, putting in the, the piece of the, the component of the drawing that makes the joke. Yeah. So anyway, so now here we are, and Peter's looking at, at he's got cat, he's got dog, and we just settled in. Miscellaneous took, what, about 15 minutes, I think? Not, <laughs> not that long. It seemed like 15 minutes. It took about seven. Okay. And it finally emerged because Bill Stout drew a missile. Yep. And then he drew an anus. Yes. He drew he drew somebody's butt with a protruding yes. uh, sphincter. And and Peter was like going, take that off the screen. I don't want to see that. Because he yeah. didn't know what it was yet. And I said, that's actually the best clue up there right yes. now. <laughs> and and finally he's saying missile anus. Missile anus. And it's like <laughs> <laughs> he gets about, th and finally, you could, you could have lit Detroit for a, a year with the light bulb that went off yes. over his head, <laughs> and the place just went. Uh, anyway, you were a perfect, were nuts. A, a perfect contestant for that. Peter. The, the artist I worked the best with was Kyle Baker, because Kyle was fantastic. I mean, I remember one once one of the words was blue, and he immediately drew the dog blue from blues clues and he put it up there and i went blue and they, you know that was an easy that that was that was a snap the best though was when the word was repulsive and everybody and 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 sergio and scott were drawing these horrific things and kyle starts drawing iron man and you were kind of going iron man what and he drew with his hand like that and a beam coming out and i said Repulsor ray, repulsive, and, <laughs> and, right. and that gave and that gave it to me, and the audience roared because you know Kyle knew me, he knew what I would react to, and when I saw the repulsor rays, that tipped it for me. What one of the single cleverest things I've ever seen a cartoonist do? Uh, we have this fellow named Mike Kazala, who is sometimes our third cartoonist, okay. and the word was easy, and he drew someone falling off a log. Oh my God! That, that clever. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah, uh, yeah. My friend, our friend Tom Galloway, who has been who's played the game a lot. I've known says, Tom for many as, years. Tom says, as soon as these went up, he's talking about the dog cat miscellaneous ones. I was making throat slashing motions yes. in the theater from the front row. So yes, I remember that. That was very comforting. Yes, we also. I remember. I, I was once walking around at a convention with Tom. And Tom was saying to me, you know, this was, the, you know, the convention was over. And he says, this was a great convention for you. You made so many people happy. And I said, yeah, but I know I pissed off somebody. And that's going to be the person that everybody hears from. And Tom's going, no, 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 you're, you're being way too pessimistic. And at that moment, this guy comes up to me and he says, would you sign my comic? And it was not a comic that I had written. It was not a comic that I've ever heard of. It was some independent thing. And I said, well, I didn't write this. I'd rather not sign something that I didn't write because I feel like I'm taking credit for something. Do you have anything else I could sign? He says, no, no, just sign this. And I said, but I don't want to sign this. I didn't write it. Do you have anything else? A program book. A napkin, a piece of paper, anything. And the guy says, no, forget it. I'm sorry to bother you. And he storms off. And Tom is standing there like this. And I said, there he goes. He cut this thin. He got here right at the end. But there goes the guy who's going to go online tomorrow and say, I walked up to Peter David, and he wasn't doing anything else, but he wouldn't sign my comic book because he was just too busy and too fabulous to do it. And other people are going to go, yeah, I heard he's a real dick. And that's, you know, that's what's going to happen. And, you know, Tom absolutely could not believe it. But, you know, I, I will always remember that. By the way, I want to thank you for this. This oh. is my Inkpot Award which I had mentioned to you 
I did not have an Inkpot Award. This is given out uh, by the San Diego Comic Convention. And I had mentioned to you that I had never gotten an Inkpot Award, and I kind of wondered why. And you went to the people of San Diego and said, why hasn't Peter David gotten an Inkpot Award? And their response was? They said, we, oh, he got one, didn't he? Isn't that, <laughs> that what is it? I think that was it. No, that was Russ Heath. Russ Heath, the same, had this, we had the same situation. Ah. They, everybody assumed he already had one. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember the response in your case. Was it the same thing? Or? It was the exact yeah. same thing. You, yeah. you told me they said, we gave him one. And you said, no, you didn't. And they said, yes, we did. And you said, look it up. And they looked it up and could not find my name anywhere. And they went, oh, crap. We never gave him one. Well, they'd give him one to a guy named Peter, and they'd give him one to a guy named David. David. And I thought that was close enough. So. Yeah, so that, so so that covered that. it. But, but yeah, uh, and, th and this is a really nice one. As a matter of fact, yeah. I, I kept it on my table at the convention the entire time. I had, a, I had a great table that year. I had this table that was right up. Oh, yes. Oh, here. Oh, there. Okay, there's, there's, there's Peter at uh, with drawn by Sergio at a quick draw game. Yep. Yes. Um, very baffled. Yep. But I had this great table the year that. I, what, what year was this? This was. Uh, uh, doesn't have the year on it. Well, whatever the year it was, I had a great table that year. It was it was right up front at the dealer's room, directly in front of the door, and every morning of the convention. The exact same thing happened. The doors opened, and 10,000 people came running in right past me. <laughs> nobody slowed. Nobody stopped to get me to sign anything. They went running past me to get to the Hasbro table or the Kenner table or Funko. Yeah, they would. Everyone went straight past me to get to Funko, you know, pretty much anywhere they could get that wasn't me. And, you know, so I felt like a lot of love those mornings. Okay. Uh, uh, in case you were not keeping up on the news, for those of you who are watching this live, it's not like we don't have enough problems, political problems in the country here. We just got huh. Chief, Chief Justice John Roberts was hospitalized last month after falling while walking near the near his home, a spokesperson, spokesperson, anyway, if, 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 well, what we need is another Supreme Court fight. Oh, we just, we could maybe poison the whole atmosphere even more, make, make everybody even matter at each other than they are. I uh, mean, it, it's not like Roberts is any great prize, but his recent ruling siding with the liberals have, have saved a number of situations because the conservatives are voting exactly the way that Trump wants them to vote vote. I mean, the recent, the recent decision that they made regarding the abortions should have been nine zero. It should not have been five to four. It should have been nine zero. They should have all been thinking the way that John Roberts was thinking that you support the decisions that the Supreme Court made in previous years, that the Supreme Court has to have fealty to the law, not sway with the political winds. And the fact that it was five to four instead of nine zero is very alarming. And the problem is that if Trump gets to put in another Supreme Court justice, we are completely screwed. Well, I don't think he's going to. And I if here's the thing that I keep thinking. It, it doesn't work the way you and I think it should work or it, it's supposed to work. Okay. Imagine, if you will, a candidate for the Supreme Court who is completely honest to God, bipartisan. He's neither a, 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 a or he or she is neither a, de a registered Democrat nor Republican nor a vowed liberal conservative. Somebody who is capable of ruling absolutely either way based wholly on the merits of the law. Right. Well, nobody wants that person. They want to. They want the guarantee of the person who's going to vote their oh, way, whichever absolutely. it is. And that's, 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 true. Yeah. that's true. And the problem is, or the, in our case, the helpful thing is that oftentimes, or at least sometimes, they will put in someone who they are absolutely convinced will march according to the orders that they want them to march to, and then they go off and do something else. 
I mean, Roberts was appointed by George W. Bush. The fact that he has ruled twice against Trump, I mean, what's he going to do? Blame Obama for that? Probably. <laughs> anyway, uh, getting back here to the chat room for a minute here. Uh, okay. Uh, Neil Ottenstein says you got your ink pot in 2016. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, Tom Galloway thinks what we're doing here is Red Button's old act. Peter David never got an ink pot or a dinner. Anyway, <laughs> you know, I, wrote, I, wrote, I wrote those things for Red Red Buttons at one time. So some of his oh really didn't, didn't get a dinner jokes, and he was he had to write about ninety three before he'd find one that he liked. It was. It was I, wonder, uh, I wonder how many people watching this who have never heard of Red Buttons. Um, I bet a lot of people have heard of Red Buttons. Now we got a lot of your friends on online right now. Uh, Peter Sanderson is online. Peter, hi. Hi, Elaine Riggs is online. Hello, Elaine. Great, good to see you. you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, our air, our air, Kath, our air conditioning is still working. Yes. Uh, uh, and, Elaine uh, Riggs asked. Uh, uh, let's see who else is on. Uh, we got a lot of people here. Jamie Coville is online, probably. Jamie. Recording. A panel right now as we as we do this. Okay. Uh, my friend Rob Word is. You don't know Rob Word. Rob Word is on. Hi, Rob. Rob is one of the great uh, experts on westerns, as you can see by his photo there. Really? Will you, okay. will you do quick draw Zoom or chat on Comic Con weekend? No, we're not. We're not going to do quick draw. If there's just technically no way to do it, but, because you need an audience. As as Bill Maher proves every Friday night. Some people, some things just need a live audience, or they're not funny. Uh, uh, is your friend April here? Uh, April? Oh, Amber. You mean Amber? Amber. Amber, oh, Am sorry. Amber is not. If, if she's online right now, she hasn't commented ah, okay. yet. But she will be. She's probably watching okay. this. If not now, then on delay. But she wanted to say hello to you, Peter. And uh, excellent. Um, Amber is uh, very sweet. Amber is is ridiculous. Yeah, except for her rotten taste in men. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, let's oh, let's go to a few, few questions here. Uh, oh, okay. Michael Saunders. Hey, Mark and Peter, what has been your most fun fan experience as a Comic Con? Oh, my most fun. Oh, geez. okay. I'll, I'll I'll tell you. I'll tell a story here. Okay. We were we were at a WonderCon. Yeah. And uh, one time, not you. Uh, okay. At least you were not involved. And there was a guy in the audience dressed as the Green Hornet. Do you remember this guy? Was it the I Green Hornet? Uh, I was I was dressed as the Green Order. That's right. Yes. Yeah. There was this person sitting there dressed as. Can you you want to tell them why you were dressed as the Green Hornet? Or or do I have to tell this story? You can <laughs> tell it. Go ahead. Peter was doing some comic. I don't remember what it was, and they flew him in as a surprise guest star yes. for a for a Sunday panel. But he wanted to go to the convention on Friday and Saturday, and they said, no, no, we want to keep it a surprise you're there, the people who flew him in. Yes. So he thought, well, I want to go to the convention and walk around. So he got himself a Green Hornet costume, put together yep. a Green Hornet costume. It was actually, I, 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 got, I got the hat off of eBay. I'd gotten the mask at San Diego some years earlier. Um, I, I, I had a long black leather coat, and believe it or not, I got a green suit off of eBay. And the best moment, though, was I was walking around, and I ran into Paul Levitz. Now, I've known Paul for something like 20 years. And I walk up to him, and I go, hi, how are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm doing fine. And we chat for a couple of moments, and I realize he has no freaking clue who I am. You did, and, that, to me. You did that to me, too. Yeah. You, we, were, we did a panel, and you, as I was leaving, you, you turned to me, and you said, Great panel, sir, or something like Martin, Mr. Evanier. And I went, yeah. oh, thank you. Uh, if I'd known, I would have, I would have said something like, "Well, you know, these are easy as long as you're not some jerk like Peter David." I mean, yeah. You know. <laughs> but uh, oh, the great thing was, you know, I'm chatting with Paul, and he's about to. He says, "Well, I have to go," and I and I pulled out my business card, and I said, "Here, feel free to get in touch with me at some point." He looks at my card, and he looks at me, and looks at the card, and he goes, "Peter," and I went. Yeah, this is a really effective disguise, I think. Because, you know, if I could fool Paul with a mask and a hat, and he's known me for 20 years. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I I had the green I had a green hornet costume the, the whole convention. It was and people were taking my picture, having no idea they were taking pictures of, you know, me. So that was entertaining. Well now allegedly Michael Jackson and several certain other celebrities have wandered around Comic Con. Sarah Michelle Gellar and Freddie Prinze. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, it's not think, unprecedented. Uh, well, um, yeah. let's see. other fun things. I was on. There was one convention. I was on a panel with uh, Val Kilmer and Katie Sackoff and um, the actress who played Kara in Smallville. I'm 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 blanking on her name. The of uh, a, a great you know great bunch of folks because we were promoting the Spider-Man video game that I had written, the one that's themed up Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2099. Peter, someone someone will text will, will in the comments line will post this person's name within ten thirty seconds, seconds probably. Somebody, yeah, somebody, somebody will post it. Yeah, they're on a, they're on like a six second delay here, but oh you know, yeah, I believe uh, it because YouTube. And and at one point, Laura, you know, Laura Laura Vandervoort. Is Laura that Vandervoort. It? That's it. Thank and you, at one point, I said, you know, I'm sitting here on a panel with three of the most gorgeous blondes from Hollywood, you know, indicating Val, who's sitting next to me, and Val Kilmer reaches over and like rubs his fist on the top of my head <laughs> affectionately, which I thought was sweet. Um, and they actually ran a clip from the game, and I. I you know how sometimes you put things in with the expectation that they're going to be cut later on? Yeah. I had a thing in a cut scene where I have J. Jonah Jameson ranting. And he says, he's ranting because Spider-Man seems to be getting more and more popular. And I had him say, I can't believe how popular Spider-Man's getting. The next thing you know, they're going to do a Broadway musical and have a whole chorus line of dancing spider man I thought they were going to cut that line. No, they recorded it and they played that scene at the at the place, and the place erupted with hysterics. And I'm sitting there going, "That scene's in the in the game." Okay, I thought they would cut it, but no, it was there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, you you see me blotting myself. I am. It is very hot in here. I don't want to open the windows because there's a lot of traffic outside right now, and I don't want to okay. turn my fan on because it sounds like like this, and you'll suddenly hear like you're in a wind tunnel. Yeah, exactly. But I can turn it on for two seconds and cool myself off. And this okay. To demonstrate it. Okay. Um, Tom Galloway, we're going to take some questions. I recall Peter has played Mary and Sam and Little Lavender, and Mark has written about the show. Do you all think Dog Pass should tear down the statue of Confederate General Jubilation T. Cornpone? <laughs> I think that would be a great comic strip to do. Um, do I think they should? Absolutely not. They, you know, they still believe in the Confederacy. You know, so should they? I mean, you know, I understand tearing down. You know, the, you know, saying it seriously. I mean, I understand people wanting to tear down the statues from the Civil War because it's really commemorating. You know people who were basically traitors. But I don't understand the people who want to tear down statues of George Washington, of Thomas well, Jefferson. Apparently that's exaggerated. There's like one person someplace who... Yeah, I mean, that's, who, who that's who absurd. Made a noise about that. I, my feeling is that I would... I don't... I, I understand it's wrong, but I would rather see, like, for example, let's, let's get... A better school money for schools in, in underprivileged areas. Let's eliminate cops beating up on black people. Let's. Right. I mean, it's no, no person's life is that much better if we tear down the statue of, of Robert E. Lee. Yeah, uh, it's it's more symbolic. Let's do the real thing, especially when the country seems to be on the same page about this. That they want to see uh, the uh, uh, the George Floyd instances stopped. They want to see. More money going to inner cities to have you know blacks and other minorities have a better chance to get into college. Yeah, that's the way the country is trending now, and that should be it. Uh, however, we do have an, a suggestion here to tear down Al Cap, who who was who was uh, who would not survive the Me Too movement today. No, um, no, uh, Cap was to say that he was right wing in his uh, philosophies would be to understate it. Yeah, that's a fascinating. Do you know? Do you know who the person was who blew the whistle on Cap in the press? No. This is, a, this is an interesting trivia question that Peter people don't know. Britt Hume. Really. The guy who's now on Fox News, Britt Hume. He was the assistant to J columnist Jack Anderson, 
in the 60s and, and in the early 70s. He was like right. a, an aspiring researcher, columnist. And mm -hmm. he's the one who uh, uh, got uh, Jack Anderson to print some of the stories about how Al Cap was being uh, shown out of collegiate areas because of complaints about him molesting college girls. Jeez, and right. one, of the, one of the interesting things in your life as you as you get older you see people changing around 1971 or so or 72 i was at a dinner with a bunch of syndicated newspaper guys uh guys who were you know in the had, you know had newspaper strips the old boys type network of guys that i think the most recent one it was like 20 years uh, milton kniff was in the group and the subject of al cap came up and it was kind of like they were started telling these jokes and, and colorful statements about this wacky, colorful guy who had tricked college girls into performing sex acts on him. It was kind of like, uh, like rape is um, uh, tricking a, a practical joke to trick someone into having sex with you. And I kind of <laughs> sat there right. going, okay. Now, the next couple of years, Jack Anderson's column expose what cap was doing and a lot of a lot of people it was like with the bill cosby thing once one person said hey he did that to me a lot of people did and in this case cap had to plead guilty it, it inspired some actual prosecutions ah and and cap had to plead guilty to sex crimes and become a regular registered sex offender he stopped he, he didn't get the punishment he deserved but he got a lot of punishment for that era right and the next time I was together with the same cartoonists, a couple of years later, Al Cap's came, name came up, and it was like, oh, he was such a sick man. I don't understand that that horrible guy. He did, you know, God, he was so self-destructive and so horrible the way he treated women. And everybody had become enlightened that rape yeah. was was not a practical joke. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and this is this is, you know, you know that older people sometimes have trouble turning loose of. Of, of things they believe their whole lives. But yeah. This was guys like in their 60s or 70s at that point who were now changing the way they felt a few years earlier. Well, I mean, we are seeing progress in terms of of the way that people want the country to go. I mean, th the biggest problem we have right now is that the representation that we have in the government is representing the opinions of the minority of the population. The majority of people are behind Black Lives Matter. The majority of people support Antifa. The majority of people support a woman's right to choose. Ah, they but support the, but all do, these do things. the majority of the wealthy political donors support that? No, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, so, that's the problem. Anyway, all right. Let's let's go to a few more. Uh, okay. Uh, questions here. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I had a whole bunch of them here. I got to scroll back here. Um, to both Peter and Mark, Damonda wants to know: name a fan name you would like to poke fun at. Uh, I don't want to poke fun at any fandom. Exactly. I mean, every fandom is special to somebody. I mean, are there fandoms that I don't understand what people are arguing about? Yes. Are there fandoms where I don't understand what the hell is going on? Yes, but I mean, you know, you know, let's well, gee, let's poke fun at anime. Except when I was a kid, we had anime. It was called Astro Boy and Eighth Man and Kimba the White Lion, Speed Kimba. Racer, Kim of the Relying, Marine Boy. You know, these these were all anime. So I really can't make fun of modern anime, considering that I grew up loving it. When I when I was um, new to comic fandom. In the late 60s, I had a couple of run-ins with science fiction fans who were really snotty about comics. I mean, mm -hmm. really, and these are guys who were like, you know, five years older than I was, and it was like uh, science fiction fandom has the the uh, uh, the inte intellectual people, and comic uh, fandom is for little kids, you know, that slightly retarded. Use yeah. a bad word. Uh, adult, a, a, a developmentally arrested children like that, yeah. and I watched that reverse as Star Trek fandom grew, because suddenly well, Star Trek fandom was attracting younger people. 
Then- well, actually, Maggie Thompson tells this great story about how there was a large group of science fiction fans who were meeting at a world con and they were all bitching about the Star Trek fans who were flooding into their convention. And oh God, these Star Trek fans are so irritating and so annoying. And what I mean, I thought of Maggie, but she said it was somebody else. A woman stood up and said, guys, you know, you have been for the last number of years complaining. How can we get more females at these conventions? I don't know if you've noticed, but at least 50% of the Star Trek fans are females. You're getting girls here at the convention, and you're complaining about it? And all the guys looked at each other, and that was the end of the meeting. Yeah, well, you know, it's, I, 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 the thing that has always struck me that if you, if you are a, fan, a big devout fan of, let's say, science fiction, this applies to all of these, you yeah. shouldn't be talking about other fandoms the way people who don't understand yours talk about yours. Well, yeah, you that's, that's, that, that's exactly that. right. Yeah, and, and it's a, a, a problem that way. And I, you know, I don't understand. A, a couple of years ago, um, Carolyn, my friend Carolyn, who we all miss, um, and I were guests of honor at a, um, a furry convention. It's okay. called the Anthrocon. It's in Pittsburgh every year. I think they still do it. And these yeah. are people who are basically dressed up as large badgers and, and, right. and such. And, and um, they were the most delightful people. They were clever and funny and, and passionate. And there was no commerce at this event. The people in the dealer's room were selling stuff they'd made just to please other people. Like, oh, I wouldn't you love to have this? You know, I'll give it to you for almost nothing just for the sake of that. Nobody was trying to make money at the convention. Uh, I think I think a lot of people lost a lot of money doing this. But it was it was it was surely a thing for joy. And these people were so nice and so terrific. And um, the last day of the convention, uh, this is what was interesting about it was they had a bunch of guests of honor. One of them was Rob Paulson, who we all know. I know Rob. And, such. and Carolyn and myself. And Carolyn was there because of Pogo, her father's newspaper strip. And I was there because I was with Carolyn and also because I did Scooby-Doo and Garfield right. and things like that. This entire convention, three days, not, nobody asked me about Jack Kirby. Not one person. Okay. So um, Carolyn is drawing you know, Pogo for people, and I'm – signing Scooby-Doo comic books and things like that. And they would have, they would open the convention in the auditorium, this auditorium with a, with everybody at the convention, no, nobody in the dealer's room, just all welcoming the guests, and introduce the guests and we make little addresses. And then they close the convention with another ceremony like that. So we get to the closing ceremony the last day and Carol and I have been treated as well as I've ever been treated at a convention they put a limo at our disposal. They gave us a great nice. podium. They gave us a suite. Um, uh, if I if if they saw me, if people saw me carrying boxes, some of Carol's boxes back to the room, they'd run up and say, "Let's ca- we'll carry your boxes for you." Things like that. Wow. And and uh, we get up there at the this closing ceremony. We're looking out, and there's you know a lot of people. Some of them in fox costumes, but most of them were were in street clothes and things at that point. And they asked me, you know, what do you think of this? Give a little speech. Tell us what you think of this convention. And I said, uh, well, there are two things I don't like about this convention. And you could see people kind of clutch their hearts. What? You found two things you didn't like about it? I said, one of them is for three days now, people like all these people here, people here have been coming up to me and saying, do we make you uncomfortable? Does our, our, our interest make, does it make you uncomfortable? Do we, do we, we make you uncomfortable? And I said, no, but being asked that over and over makes me uncomfortable. Why don't you people just be proud of what you do and enjoy right. it? Don't act like you have to apologize for it. Yeah, there are some people who will never understand it. I don't understand why people eat coleslaw. I don't understand why people vote for George Bush. I don't understand why people jump out of airplanes. You know, yeah. it's a whole mess of these things. I don't understand, but they work for those people and they're fine. I don't have to approve everything everybody does. Right. Just, just be yourselves and stop acting like, like somebody should have a negative reaction to you. Mm-hmm. And I got like a standing ovation for this. People went and they put it on the website. They quoted it. Like it was like, you know, the, the Gettysburg address of furry. <laughs> and then I said, here's the other thing I don't like about this convention. 
you don't ask people to be guests of honor twice. <laughs> they all broke out and laughed. And, and it was a very, it was like, I've never felt so much just to use an awkward word, love coming from the audience. And, and I, I, we were treated so wonderfully. I have it, never been to a furry convention. I've been at conventions where furries are, but I've never been to a convention that is a furry convention. Yeah, well, we had we had to judge. I've never been invited, I guess. The one part that got really awkward was we had to judge the art show as the okay. guests of honor, and the art show had um, this lovely section where all these people had done these beautiful paintings. Some some of the costumes these people were wearing took thousands of dollars and and months and months of work. They were beautifully made costumes, and they had artwork that was in the same uh, passion. Something right. paintings that obviously people spent years working on. Mm -hmm. And then there was an X-rated section with furry characters copulating and doing things to each other. Right. And it's it was a little tough to judge because I was so out of tune with the sexuality of sure. furrydom. Yeah. I, I didn't even bothered by it. I just didn't quite understand what was the, what was happening. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just, you know, it's it, it, different anatomy for me. So, but uh, we just had a great time and I would, would go back if, if they ask me again, uh, I don't. I don't think I don't. I like most of us are going to any conventions for a while, but. <laughs> but yeah, I I can't think of any I would make fun of. I mean, I don't understand honestly why they all can't get along. I still do not understand to this day why Star Trek fans and Star Wars fans are at war with each other about their respective fandoms. Oh, Star Trek's better than Star Wars. They're both. It, it, it's like it's it's like. Having an argument over what's the best Perry Mason novel, or you know, I mean, it, it, it's it's just so it's just so freaking absurd. I live in a world where I'm entertained by both Star Trek and Star Wars. One is not better than the other. Uh, here's a here's a message we just got from Peter Cat. Thanks for your kind words about furries, Mark. I'm the art show director for Anthrocon. Got Hello, it. Peter Cat. Um, that's, that was a great little convention. We had a we had a wonderful time with uh, Dr. Kagi and I guess his name, who was running it. Uh, and I just uh, it was so refreshing because you're surrounded at comic conventions by so much commerce. To say and, nothing of the fact that I bet a furry convention would be the absolute perfect convention to go to in this day and age of COVID. Yes, because that's if right. Everybody's Everybody, covered head to toe in costumes. You don't have to worry about people coughing on you. That's right. Yeah, that's a good thing here. Yeah. But uh, so we no, we had a great time there. Uh, uh, let me see. Let me get some other people who haven't 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 addressed some of their questions yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Isabel wrote for both of you pre-internet. You both wrote years of terrific columns to the Comics Buyer's Guide. Yeah. Have you considered making those columns available to your digital audiences? Now, in the comment thread, people Ooh. have pointed out that we put them. You had a book of them. I believe, and I put a couple books out of mine. I, 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 and, I, and I put have, several books out, yes. Yeah, I have some of mine on my website. I, I haven't posted some of the ones that are in the books, and I haven't posted some of the ones I look back and go, oh, I'll tell people that Peter David wrote this one. You know, it's uh, – some of them some of them don't hold up, but uh, – hmm. uh, I, I, I've really been contemplating the idea of putting out a, a thorough collection of my entire But I Digress – you know, all 15 years worth of the thing. Um, whether it would be available on digital, yeah, it would probably be available on digital as well. If I do, I'd probably just put it out through Crazy 8. Chuck Huber writes, Peter, is Space Cases streaming anywhere now? If not, are there any prospects in the content-hungry era? Space Cases uh, can be found in its entirety on YouTube. Tell people tell people what this show was for those who might Space not. Space Cases was a TV series that I co-created with Bill Moomy. Uh, Bill, for those of you who are going, I know that name, played Will Robinson on the TV series Lost in Space. And we created Space Cases, which ran for two seasons on Nickelodeon. And Nickelodeon apparently sucks when it comes to making their – past content available for the modern day audiences. I mean, Nickelodeon has a host of really entertaining shows that they have not released on DVD. Um, Are You Afraid of the Dark, The Secret World of Alex Mack, 
uh, the the the, the uh, Shelby Wu, the Mystery Files of Shelby Wu, and Space Cases. You know, they just don't put these things out on DVD. They have no priority as far as Nickelodeon is concerned, which seems kind of insane to me. Um, Space Cases uh, was a series about a group of uh, misfit students who wound up, you should pardon the expression, lost in space. Um, the show is particularly notable. Our star was a, was an actor named Walter Emanuel Jones, who most of you would recognize as the original Black Power Ranger. And we cast a 13-year-old actress named Jewel State as an engineering genius. So, yes, we managed to reach through time and space and rip off Joss Whedon 10 years before Firefly by casting Jewel State as an engineering genius in space. Um, it was a very entertaining series, and like I said, all the episodes can be seen on YouTube. But at this point, that's about the only place that they are really available. Okay, uh, this just in uh, Peter Kent said, Unfortunately, costumes don't count as PPE. Anthrocon was to have taken place this past weekend, but we canceled it in April. Ah, for reasons we we certainly understand. Yes, of course. Uh, all right. Let me go back. I missed a bunch of questions okay. near the top of this um, uh, thing here. What was There was a question about the comic book legal defense fund somebody posted. Oh, here it is. Uh, will you two be supporting the comic book legal defense fund after the recent scandal with its director, Charles Brownstein? I still believe in the CBODF's basic mission. Was Charles's behavior appropriate? Good Lord, no. Was his resignation well-timed? No, he should have resigned 15 years ago. But that really doesn't diminish the continued need for the CBLDF. We live in a censorious environment, and we need all the help we can get. And if some comic book store is suddenly being threatened because somebody wants to shut them down because they were selling a comic book that accurately depicted Picasso in the nude while he was living in Paris, um, that person isn't going to give a damn about Charles Brownstein. What they're going to care about is, is the CBLDF going to be there to defend me? So, yes, I think we still need to support the CBLDF and its mission, even though Charles Brownstein's behavior was wholly inappropriate. I think I agree with Peter, except I really don't know anything about what Charles Brownstein did. I haven't, that's not, has not been on my radar. Uh, uh, Char Charles was actually, you know, long story short, Charles was actually abusive. Okay. If, if, if that was indeed the case, then I agree with Peter, but I don't know enough about that to, to have an opinion. I actually haven't, I support the idea of the comic book legal defense fund. I actually haven't had any contact with them for a long time. Really, and uh, every so often they write me and say, "Can we reprint something you and Sergio did for us?" And I go, "Okay," and that's about it. I don't. Yeah. I, I'm I'm kind of out of that loop. Uh, there's a lot of loops I'm out of. Uh, <laughs> so let's see. Um, let's see who else we've got here. That. Uh, 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 Gary Kundal asks, "Are there artists plural?" implied plural, that either of you have not worked with yet that you really want to work with? Honestly, at this point, I can't think of anyone who I have not had the honor to work with. I've worked with some of the greatest artists in the history of the industry. I've been very fortunate, I mean, uh, in that regard. I've worked with everyone from John Buscema to John Romita to Kurt Swan. Uh, Steve Ditko, George Perez, I mean, you know, Todd McFarlane. I've worked with a any, host. Any, of anybody, any, anybody, anybody good? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been, uh, there are a number of artists that I am proud to call co workers. There are a number of artists that I am proud to call friends. Um, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head who's still alive that I have not had the chance at some point in my career 
to have worked with. I feel very blessed in that regard. How about you? I don't really have anybody. I tell you, I like, I, I, I kind of gave up writing comic books that were going to be drawn by strangers or people I didn't mm -hmm. know. Well, I, 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 I've not been that happy with the comics I've written that were drawn by people that I had no contact with, that I didn't couldn't call on the phone and talk to or hang out with at conventions. Uh, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I will. I doubt I will ever have again the wonderful relationship I had with the late Dan Spiegel, who was my favorite artist to work with of that kind of comic, or with, with Will Minio, who was my favorite comic artist to work with on that kind of comic, or that guy with the mustache who's watching the the guy from Mad Magazine, whatever his mm -hmm. name is. Um, I like working with people I, that I, where I can get in, they can get involved in the, my end of the project. I can get involved in their end of the project and uh, we're on the same page. And, and so, yeah, there's a few friends of mine I'm talking about doing projects with, but um, uh, there's nobody to come. I would have, you know, there's a certain part of us that would like to work with people whose work we look, we read as readers, you know, I, I had a, I did a story that was drawn by Gene Colan. My God, I'm writing a comic book drawn by Gene Colan. Dan Spiegel was, was the same way with me because I, I, I knew Dan's work for years and years and years before I even knew his name, and he's drawing my stories. And I work with a lot of those guys. And there's a person, you know, there's like that connectivity with your old self. Yeah. You suddenly realize I remember reading this guy's work when I was, you know, nine or twelve or whatever, and that's very exciting. And most of those guys are gone. Yeah. Most of the guys whose work that I read when I was nine or 15 years old, even, you know, the 15 are gone. And, uh, but it was, it was, I was enough, it was enough for me to meet them, interview them, hang out with them, spend time with them. I, I uh, as I have said on other ones of these interviews, I'm one of those people who's kind of less interested in Superman and Spider-Man than I am in Siegel and Schuster and Steve Ditko. Yeah. I, I'm really more interested in the people who made the comics. Um, and, and, and I have all sorts of theories about why they did good work on this book and why they did lesser work on that work book and such like that. Uh, and I don't feel connected to the current comic book world very much because, you know, I, when I look at the current versions of Superman and Spider-Man and Hulk or whatever it is, it's like when I look at the Dodgers and I don't see Sandy Koufax, yeah. you know, you know Maury will to me, the Dodgers are Sandy Koufax and Maury Wills and, you know, Johnny Roseboro and, and, you know, Walter Alston and people like that. And I'm not knocking the current ones. I just haven't connected with them sure. that much. So there's some fabulous artists out there. And if I could get a connection with them, I might be interested in such. And Actually, I have thought of someone I'd like to work with. All right. John Byrne. I would love to do a Hulk comic book with John Byrne. I mean, if you would stick to the script I wrote, I would love it. I would love to work with John on, on, on a Hulk series. I think that would be fun. You just answered Holly Buchanan's story. Really? Uh, question here. Pat, go back in time and address the same question. If you had a time machine to work with anyone, oh, okay. you choose one or two favorites. Okay. Uh, I guess I guess I guess you could go back farther than John Byrne for that. <laughs> For the, your answer for that, uh, no, that's um, well, Jack, obviously. I mean, that would be incredible to work with Jack. Yeah, um, I worked with Steve, yeah, like I said, yeah, Jack Kirby. That would that, that would be the only person I can think of from you know, from the original crowd who I grew up with that I have not had a chance to work with, okay, uh, Peter. Yes. Vac think, Vac think. News from me, TV. Peter, is there any hope for a Marvel movie featuring the complex Gray Hulk? Thanks for being the first to make writing why I read a comic. <laughs> um, I haven't the slightest idea. Nobody at Marvel Studios ever consults me about anything. I mean, if they had, I would have told them that the character's name is pronounced Talos, not Talos. Um when when merged Hulk showed up in Mar in uh, Avengers Endgame, that came as a complete surprise to me. I wasn't expecting that either. So no, Marvel Studios never consults with me. If they're going to bring in the Gray Hulk, that would be a complete surprise. And I don't think that they would. 
I mean, the Gray Hulk is such a completely different character from the way that he is now that I, you know, I don't think they would really want to go to all the trouble of doing that just to tell that story. I'd love it if they did the maestro. I think that that could be fascinating. I think that they could make a comic book, a few, they could make a movie of future and perfect. I think that would really kick ass, but I don't think that they're going to do anything with the gray Hulk. Okay. Uh, Peter, we have here a, a series of questions here. I'm going to just read them quickly off here. Dr. Empirical says, I once covered a panel with Peter and Greg Hildebrandt for an online journal. For some reason, I got confused. I wrote that it was Tim Hildebrandt, embarrassing since Tim had been <laughs> dead for some years. Right. Peter very politely corrected me in the comments section. I immediately alerted the journal to have them correct it. Okay. Uh, goes on. Wait a minute. Where's the next one here? All right. Hold on. Sadly, the journal did a fine replace with Greg for Tim. That would have been fine, except that somewhere in the article I'd used the word ultimately, which came out <laughs> all regularly. <laughs> Oh, great, great fleet. <laughs> yeah, that can be one of the hazards of search and replace. That same thing has happened with me, where I've done a search and replace, and suddenly, you know, words became nonsensical words. So, yeah, you do have to go back and proofread whatever it is that you've done once you do the search and replace. Despite that, thank you, Peter, for your courteous and timely correction of my dumbass move. Oh, it's it's fine. I mean, I I have I have no trouble with that. I I I tend to see things wrong in the world. I mean, I'll I'll give you an example. Many many years ago, when I was still working in direct sales, um, they would always send the covers around, and it was my job to sign off on the covers and make sure that the price was correct. This is back in the days when. And, and the covers would always have the coloring attached. This is before computer coloring. The coloring would be done on an 8.5 by 11 Xerox of it so that those color guides would then go to the color separators. And they sent me the cover for Indiana Jones number one. And I looked at it, and the price was correct, and that was fine. And I, I saw that everything seemed okay, and I was about to send it back, but something made me look at the color separations. And I usually look, you know, I, I usually just glanced at them. They look fine. But I stared at it, and I realized something was wrong. There was a guy in the background who had three arms. He, he was holding a woman hostage, and he had three arms. And I'm going, why does this guy have three arms? I mean, I guess it's possible. It's an Indiana Jones comic. Maybe the guy has three arms. And I looked at the cover, and I looked at the coloring, and I realized that what had happened was that the colorist had colored the woman's arm that was outstretched reaching towards Indy as if it was the guy's arm. So, and so there was a coloring mistake, I thought. So I wrote a note on the, on the thing that said, is, this guy, is the guy in the background supposed to have three arms? And I said to the intern, would you please make sure that Louise Hymanson, or I think with time Louise Jones, checks my note? And he says, okay. And he goes back, and five minutes later, Wheezy comes running into my office, and she's going, thank you. Thank you for catching that. Oh, thank God you caught that. I would have been in such trouble with Lucasfilms. Um, no, that guy's not supposed to have three arms. And it saw print correctly, thank God. But, yeah, I, I'm just used to looking around the world and noticing stuff that's wrong and and correcting it. Okay, let's let's test you, Peter. Peter, would, oh, you, God. Move, would you move slightly to your left? Cra to my left. left. Your left. Okay, right there. That's right. Fine. Okay, I'm going to move slightly to my right here. Hold on. All right. Now, I'm going to put up between us a... Uh, cover of a comic book that I edited. Okay. You, you can get more on the friend on the on the frame if you want to. All right. Yeah. This is an issue of Blackhawk. Okay. All right? What's wrong with this cover? Uh, this is as printed. This is as printed. Oh you got Hitler in the background. Hmm. Huh. I'm not spotting it. 
it's kind of the same thing that was wrong on that on the cover that Louise. There's, a, col there's a coloring error. Yeah. Hmm. Blackhawk is manacled with his arms above his head. Okay. Blackhawk is what? Blackhawk has his arms up. He's manacled over his head. He's 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 tied up. You see his arm his his arms are straight up, and he's yeah. got manacles on him, keeping up. Okay, whose hand is holding the gun? It looks like Blackhawk's hand is holding the gun. It's supposed to be Hitler's. It's supposed to be colored brown. Oh, it is. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. That the problem. Okay, now I see it. The problem is that the logo completely blocked out. Black Hawk's hands. Well, anyway, Black oh, I didn't see. Yeah, yeah, I see now the manacles up there. So his hands are over his head. Yeah, but Black Hawk is in blue and Hitler is in brown. Right, but the sleeve is blue. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. So it, looks like, it, looks like, it looks like the scene in, in Blazing Saddles where Cleavon Little is holding the gun to his own head. To his own head. Yeah, I was wondering from the angle of the gun why it looked like he was pointing it at his own forehead. I did not see that the hands. Because I'm sitting here staring at the gun, going, something's wrong with the gun. I didn't notice, because of the logo and everything, that his hands are manacled over his head. Now that you point it out, yeah, now I see it. Yeah, so, anyway, you can, you can back. You, you reminded me of that. Ah. Anyway, so, uh, let's see. we got a whole mess of more questions here. That, okay. That, uh, uh, yeah, everybody else in the, in the chat room got it before you did. Oh, great. Uh, uh, Peter, I saw you, Gaiman, and Harlan Ellison at a con shortly after 9-11, and it was great chemistry between you all. What is your favorite Harlan memory? Oh, God, there's so freaking many Harlan memories. I mean, my best Harlan memory. Huh. Okay, my best Harlan memory is that Harlan was going to be getting... The um, he was being inducted into Science Fiction Hall of Fame at a convention in Arizona, and he was complaining because none of his friends were going to be attending the convention. And for some reason, I said, "You know what? Screw it! I'm I'm going to check flights." And I managed to get a really inexpensive flight out to Arizona. And because I was going at JFK, naturally the damn plane left an hour and a half late. And I drove like I've never driven at 90 miles an hour. But that's how fast I was driving to get from the airport to the hotel. Because I was convinced that I was not going to be there on time. And I got there. And they were just wrapping up the presentation. And Harlan was sitting there on stage, clearly bored out of his ever-loving mind. I mean, he was like, please, just give me this damn award and let me go to bed. He was just out of his mind with boredom. I got there. Susan, his wife, saw me and she said, you're here. What are you doing here? And I told her. And she said, they're just wrapping up. And I said, could you tell them that I want to say something? And they had just finished up with their guests. And they said, okay, we have one more person who wants to talk about Harlan. And I got up on stage without any introduction. And I started speaking. And Harlan's head snapped around. And for the first time in something like two hours, he came to life. And he's like, oh, my God. And I stood up there. And I don't even remember what I said. But when I got done talking, I talked for like a couple of minutes. And when I got done, Harlan leaped up out of his chair. He comes over. He hugs me. And then he says, I dreamt one night I was on the road to heaven, on a boat to heaven. And I said, and by some chance, I had brought my dice along. And we proceeded to launch into a rendition of Sit Down, You Rock in the Boat from My Fair Lady. And the place. It's not from My nuts. Fair Lady. It's not from, not from My from, Fair from Lady. Guys and Dolls. And the place went nuts, you know, with, with Harlan and I singing from Guys and Dolls. So that would probably be up there. But, I mean, you know, he was the best man of my wedding. Um, and he gave a best man and he gave a best man speech that must have been heard to be believed. Um, 
he he was he was there for so many you know important things in my life. I know exactly what what that fan is referring to. Um, that was called the three high verbals. That was at Massachusetts Institute. That was not a convention. That was a speaking appearance at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, in which we came, in which I was the starting act, and I came out and I said, "Hello, my name is Peter David, or as I shall henceforth be known, the fat guy who was the opening act for Neil Gaiman and Harlan Ellison," which got a big laugh. And Harlan, Neil, and I had all decided that each of us would do 15 minutes. And then we would throw it open to Q&A. I did 15 minutes. Neil did 15 minutes. Harlan, 45. Of course. Of freaking course. But, um, you know, it was, it was a great time. I mean, we just, and, you know, like I said, so many very fond memories of Harlan. I mean, his passing a couple of years ago was just absolutely devastating. Okay. Now, speaking of people we've lost, this question <laughs> comes up here. Chuck Huber writes, Newsarama just put out a tribute to Carol Kalish. Yes. It's Kalish, not Cal Uh Could Peter yeah. and Mark share a favorite memory of Carol? For those of you who don't know, I don't know if anybody does know, Carol Kalish was a... Uh, um, I guess you say, uh, as, I don't know if executive is the right word. She worked at Marvel for years and was very much involved with the direct sales market and yes. the distribution of Marvel comics. <laughs> and she died very suddenly one day, I think around 91 or so, if I remember. She it died on September 5th, 1991. Yeah. I know this because she died one day after my third daughter was born. Ah. Well, anyway, it was very unexpected. <laughs> Yeah. And, and some people are still recovering from it. Um, and um, you want to go first or shall I do one? Sure, no, I, I, sure. I'm, I will always remember my job interview. Um, you have to understand that I actually interviewed Carol first. I was writing an article about the direct sales market. And I sat down and talked with Carol. And we talked for three hours until both of our throats were raw. And at the end, she asked me, how did I get off from work to come and interview her? And I said, well, I work for Playboy Paperbacks in the sales department, and we're going out of business. Playboy Paperbacks is being, is being purchased by Berkeley Books, and we're all out of a job. So I told my boss that I'm going out for an interview, and he assumed that I was going out for a job interview and said, good luck. And she said, you're going to be out of work? And I said, yeah, by the end of the month. And she said, I'm going to be promoted to sales manager by the end of the month, and I'm going to need an assistant. So I came back a week or so later, and Carol was sitting behind a desk putting together what appeared to be a model kit of a pterodactyl. And I said, is that a pterodactyl? And she said, oh, no, this is... um." Uh, of um, Rodan. She said, this is Rodan. And she proceeds to tell me who Rodan is. And as she's telling me about Rodan, she reaches for some, she reaches for a piece that's on the far end of her desk. And her wheelchair goes out from under her and she hits the ground with a loud thud. And I'm sitting there going like, what the hell? And she scrambles back up into her chair, folds her hands and says, so why do you want to work at Marvel Comics? And I sat there for a moment and I said, you see this suit? This is a, a winter suit. It's the only suit I own. If I have to keep going for job interviews in the summer, I'm going to need to buy a lighter suit. And I really don't want to have to do that. And she said, that's a great answer. Let me introduce you to Ed Shukin. Ed was the was the uh, head of circulation, and I wound up getting her job. So, but I will always remember her just falling off the chair and scrambling right back up, and saying, and immediately going. So, why do you want to work at Marvel? What's yours? Um, boy, there's a bunch of them. Uh, uh, around, I'm gonna guess this is like mid '80s, '86, '86. 
uh, a little comic book shop opened up uh, within walking distance of my house. Nice. In a little crummy location in a strip mall. The guy who ran it, uh, his name was Jack. I don't remember his last name at the moment. He was a longtime comic fan, and he had taken everything he owned in the world, which is you know, life savings, and put it into this little comic shop. To try and because he, he was trying to follow his passion and he won he decided he hated his old job and he was doing this and he was starving to death at this place he was a, it was a badly laid out a bad location for a comic shop it was a badly laid out shop he didn't know what he was doing um, he was getting his comics from a uh, a sub distributor he was paying X more for his comics than anyone else because hey. somebody else was acting as middleman so even when he sold stuff he didn't make very much money off it. And I walked in there, and uh, he didn't know who I was. And uh, we got to talking a little bit. And um, uh, and one of the problems with the store was he was chain smoking incessantly. Oh, and I yeah. couldn't I couldn't stay in the store. I could not actually. I, I am very allergic to cigarette smoke, and I don't like it. Ah. And I don't want to be around it. And I finally said to him, you know, you ought to. Um, uh, Stop smoking in the store. You're going to drive some. There's going to be some paying customers. You're going to drive out of here. Yeah. And he just basically said, "I can't stop." You know. So about um, two weeks later, I walked in there with uh, mm. Dave Stevens. Dave and I were having lunch, and we walked into the store, and um, uh, Dave sees a comic of his that just came out from Pacific. I think it was a Rocketeer comic, and he goes, "Oh, look at that! It's out!" And he takes it. And he starts looking off the rack. And he starts looking through it. And this guy, Jack, sees this guy, and he walks up to me, snatches the comic out of his hand and says, you know, hey, this isn't a place to read them. You want to buy them or, you know. And Dave Wonderful. Is, and he storms out of the store. And I said, you know, he said, uh, uh, hey, your friend's real testy. I said, well, he feels he ought to be able to look at a comic book that he wrote and drew. And the guy goes, that's Dave Stevens? That's Dave Stevens, my favorite artist? And I oh, said, God. Yeah, yes, you just drove him out of your store. Okay. <laughs> so Dave and I leave. So now, um, uh, about two weeks later, I was in the store with Steve Gerber. Hmm. And the same damn thing happened. There's the new Howard the Duck is out. And Steve goes over to look at it. And the guy walks up to the Steve Gerber. He saw him come in with me. You would think he would have figured. You think you put that you together, know, yeah. And he, and he, and he he snatches the comic out of Steve Gerber's hands and Steve goes, you know, ballistic and storms out of the store. And, and I said, you did it again. He said, that's, is, is that Gene Colton? No, that's Steve Gerber. Steve Gerber, my favorite writer. Oh my God. <laughs> so I get it. I go in again to the store one day and he says, how come you know people like Steve Gerber and, uh, Dave Stevens. I said, well, I write comic books. He said, really? Who are you? And I told him. And he goes, oh, I love the DNA agents. And I love Gru and all that stuff like that. And he started unburdening himself to me about why he was he was broke. He was going to lose the store. His wife was going to leave him because uh, he had invested all their money in this thing. The store was a disaster. Um, and I said, uh, you don't know what you're doing here. Let me bring somebody by who can talk to you. So Carol was in town for something. Okay. I took, I asked her, and she went to this guy's store with me, and I introduced her, and she spent an hour, hour and a half, teaching this guy Comic Shop 101, how to run a comic book shop. She told him everything he should be doing, including the fact that he should stop smoking in the store. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and he listened to her... Um, uh, Ted like took notes down real quickly. He goes, "Oh my God, I'm doing that wrong," you know. And he was like so grateful, like I was gonna save his life. Now, I, I, he gave she gave him way more time than than he would ever mean to Marvel. Right. He was never gonna sell that many comics in that little location of his. Mm -hmm. But she just took pity on the guy, and if he and if he was a dealer. She needed to. He, she needed to support dealers, and she explained yeah. to him. And I, I learned more about comic book shops listening to Carol in that ninety minutes or so than I could have learned my rest of my life about retail outlets and stores. And she explained to him about cash registers. He didn't have a cash register, and she explained to yep. him about accounting. And she explained to him, and it was so helpful and so wonderful. Uh, now. 
the story yeah. unfortunately has an unhappy ending because right. the guy didn't stop smoking and he dropped dead about six months later. Oh, great. And, and his wife closed the store and sold off the, the, the things there. But the point was he had a shot at it. He didn't yeah. have a shot at it before. He had a chance to, and Carol was so good about that. Uh, and uh, uh, and it was just, and, and she was she was the one who brought Gru to Marvel for the Epic line. She's the one who who, who called me up and he, she said, you know, Pacific's going to go under. You guys, if you want to come to um, uh, to to Epic, we're, you know, we'll, we, I will clear the way for you with all the people. Right. Who, obstacles and she helped us we did grew there for 10 years 120 issues without missing yeah. a deadline and she was responsible for us being there and she also was always calling me and giving me tips to pass on to jack kirby's lawyers <laughs> about things that marvel was doing to him that that he had to call up and, and stop uh you know well she, she was she was a spy uh, occasionally for us. carol carol's one of those people who looked at the world and saw it not as it was, but as it could be. She looked at comic book stories and she saw the possibilities that they represented. And she did everything she could to get them to become what she saw that they could become. I mean, she's like the definition of they might be giants. I don't mean the, the musical group. I mean, you know, the, the, the famous movie, with George C. Scott, where he says that, you know, Don Quixote looking at windmills and saying that they were giants is, of course, insane. But looking at them and saying that they might be giants, well, you know, at one point someone looked at bread mold and said it might be penicillin. You know, being able to look at things and seeing what they could be, if we weren't able to do that, we'd still be up in the trees with the apes. And Carol looked at the world and wanted to make it into what she envisioned. And she was very much in the process of doing that. I mean, she was afraid that the marketplace would be what it has effectively become, which is that it's more or less a monopoly with, uh, you know, just basically one distributor. She was a big believer in opening distributors. When I started with Marvel, there were 12 distributors. Uh, during my time there, we wound up moving it up to 20. We had, I think, like 23 at one point. She was always big on opening up distributors or smaller distributors. She wanted it to be as spread out as possible. She never wanted it to become collapsed into a... Uh, one in one place, which is unfortunately what eventually happened. Yeah. Uh, Richard Gersh wrote, I still recall Peter's moving eulogy at Carol Kalish's memorial. Thank you. We've had to do a lot of memorials in our lifetimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, I, the I, problem I, is that once you start getting old enough, you stop making friends, you just start losing the ones you had. Yeah. Well, you know, I look at it this way I've got. In my Rolodex or whatever you'd call a, you know, my, the Microsoft, <laughs> the Microsoft Outlook phone book, whatever you'd call it now. I just um, call it my telephone, but okay. I, I, I have like three thousand names, and if you know three thousand people, one of them is going to die every week, just on yeah. all of averages. And some of them are in their, you know, eighties and nineties. I mean, were we that shocked that ninety-eight-year-old Carl Reiner passed away? It's, no, it's not. Uh, uh, you, you have to celebrate the amazement that he lived that long instead of absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, it let's not talk not, about death, let's not talk about that. No, let's talk about fun things here. Okay. I'm looking for, for more. I don't know, we have we got, a, we got a sharp crowd, uh, watching us. Uh, good, I mean, we have 145 people online right now. Is that uh, good? That's pretty good, yeah. Okay, uh, I know, don't know. know. No, it's it's fine, and because most people watch these. Later on, uh, okay. They, 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 this will rerun forever, and people, the people who joined us, most of these people weren't there when we started, so they're going to watch the first half later mm -hmm. on and catch up with all this type of thing. Uh, right. Peter, if if somebody who was unfamiliar with your work said, uh, "Would you give me one thing to read of yours?" What would you hand them? One thing. One. Thing. Well, first off, it depends upon what they like to read. I mean, I still remember once when I was at, this is how far back it was, I was at a Borders Books, and I was doing a, 
a book signing and nobody was there. And this guy walks up to me and he says, so have you written anything that I might have read? And I said, well, I don't know. What do you like to read? And he says, nothing. <laughs> and, and, I that, didn't know and, that, and that man is the president of the United States today. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know which was more insane, that he was asking me a question to which the answer could not possibly be anything useful, or that he was in a bookstore. It would be like me walking into a butcher and saying, what do you have that I would like to eat? And they'd say, well, we don't know. What do you like to eat? What meat do you like? And I go, I'm a vegetarian. I mean, what are you doing in the butcher? Um, so it depends what they like to read. If they like to read Star Trek, I point them at Zadi. If they like to read comic books, I would guide them to Fallen Angel. If they like to read The Incredible Hulk, I would point them at Future Imperfect. If they like straight-up fantasy, I would suggest Apropos of Nothing. Um, you know, that that's, that's, you know, off the top of my head. I mean, I have published over 100 novels. I've written over 1,000 comic books. So trying to reduce it to a handful of stuff is really a really a little bit problematic. People ask me all the time, what's your favorite thing that you've ever written? It's like saying, which child is your favorite child? You know, I mean, I love everything that I've written. There's some things I like better than others, but I have an, I have an attachment to everything that I've produced that has my name on it. That's good. That's a good answer. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, has the pandemic affected your life that much? I mean, you know, we're we're freelance writers. We work at home. Yeah, um, I mean, my typical all day. My typical day before the pandemic is I would come downstairs. I'd sit at my desk. I write. At the end of the day, I go back upstairs. My life hasn't really changed all that much. The major difference is I can't go to the gym and I can't go bowling. So my social life has pretty much diminished and my ability to get exercise has has been somewhat harsh, has been somewhat crippled. But other than that, um, you know, I'm not really able to go anywhere. I can't go visit anybody. I can't go to uh, museums or aquariums or the movies. I really miss going to the movies. There are no movies. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there are, there are movies on TV now. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I never got to see the black widow. I haven't gotten to see wonder woman 86. Uh, I haven't gotten to see a host of films. On the other hand, I did get to see Hamilton, but then again, I've seen Hamilton on Broadway too. Yeah. I saw Hamilton at, um, Pantages when I was out here. I took yeah. Amber and we're, we're walking ah. across the theater. I, I managed to get great seats at a re decent, decent price. I was, oh, nice. I had a, I had a connection. So uh, uh, we're walking to the theater, and she says to me, well, what kind of music is in this is this play? God, and I said, well, a lot of it's rap. Actually. Yeah. So we sit there, and the show starts, and they're like, you know, a minute or two into the first song, and she turns to me, she said, I thought you were kidding. <laughs> <laughs> And we loved it. I mean, it was just a oh, wonderful yeah. thing. Which somebody asked here, uh, tell us some of Peter, uh, Robert, Richard Gersh has been asking good questions. Peter, tell us some of your musical roles. Nah. We don't, we don't, we mentioned Mary and Sam. What else have you played? Um, I played Vince Fontaine in Greece. Um, musical roles. I was in, two, I was, well, Kev? I played Sancho Panza in two different productions of Man of La Mancha. Um, I was in two different productions of uh, 1776. In one, I played Colonel McCain. In the other, I played Richard Henry Lee. Richard Henry Lee is the best role yeah. in musical theater. Yeah, you're, in Ron, the, Ron, you're, Ron, you're in the show for about 15 minutes. And you, you're in the first scene. You sing, sit down, John. You come out in scene two. You sing the best song in the show, The Release of Virginia. You are you are come out you you miss the first like five to ten minutes of the endless scene three. You come in, you declare that 
America is and have a right ought to be a free and independent nation. You then get to sit there and you don't have any lines through that endless scene. Scene three of 1776 is the longest scene in musical theater history not to have a song in it. Yeah. At the end of scene three, you declare that you have to go off to Virginia to be governor. And then you just hang out in the dressing room until curtain call. And you, you, you got to go refresh the missus, too, isn't that? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's right. That's I wrote a whole line. Star Trek novel uh, when I was in the uh, when I was in a, one production of 1776. Uh, it, it was great. Um, and I, yeah, being Vince Fontaine was fun, although Vince doesn't have any songs. But what I mentioned? No, no. He said aside from Marrington. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm talking to my wife, by the way. Um, we did this thing when we did the production of of uh, Greece. We treated it like it was a reunion of Rydell High uh, alumni, and I and one or two other people came out while the audience was assembling and greeted them in character, welcoming welcoming them to the Rydell High reunion. And a lot of these people were teenagers in the 1950s. They were all senior citizens now. But, I mean, I, I always remember this one old woman who's in a wheelchair who's going, dance with me, Vince, dance with me. And I said, of course, sweetheart. And I, and I whirled her around in the wheelchair, and she was so happy. <laughs> Um, yeah, doing musical theater is a lot of fun. I love, uh, I love, I love there, musical theater. Is there is there a role you you'd love to play if someone founded a production of it? Oh Jesus, um, Jesus, that's in uh, yeah. We know that. We know that show, well, yeah. actually, I wouldn't mind being um, uh, Herod in uh, in Jesus Christ Superstar. You know, because because he because he's got a great song. How about nicely, nicely? I've actually, I've actually auditioned to play nicely, nicely. I didn't get the role, but uh, I've auditioned to play nicely, nicely Johnson and Guys and Dolls. How about? Oh, I wouldn't how mind about, playing Eliza Doolittle's dad in My Fair Lady. How about Marcellus Washburn in Music Man? Marcellus would be great. I would love to do Shapoopy. Yeah. You know, I think that that would be true. Oh, here's actually a good musical. I have to say, I'm one of the few straight white men who really enjoys, you know, musicals. Here's a here's a good musical story. Um, I was at a New York Comic Con, and I was doing autographs. And this gentleman comes over, and there, there's two of them, and one of them is wearing a T-shirt that looks like a stylized image of Jafar from Aladdin. And I said, "Is that is that supposed to be Jafar?" And the guy who's in front of me getting my autograph says, yes, it is. This gentleman is actually the stage manager of the Broadway musical Aladdin, and I play the genie. And I went, wait, what? And he said, this gentleman is the stage manager of Aladdin, and I play the genie. And I went, you play the genie in Aladdin? I saw you on the Tony Awards for God's sake. And he looked surprised. He said, you watch the Tony Awards like it airs on Hulu or something. And I said, oh, I love it. So we start chatting. And I said to him, I haven't had a chance to see Aladdin yet because every time I get in contact with them, tickets are sold out. And he says, you need tickets. How many tickets do you need? The following Sunday, we're sitting there at Aladdin in the house seats. And the genie has just finished singing Friend Like Me, and everyone's cheering, and, and the genie's going, thank you, thank you very much, love you all, Peter David, you're fantastic. And I'm going, <laughs> holy crap! You know, and he then, and he was in Aladdin for another, you know, year or so, and then he left it to join another musical, Hamilton. He now, uh, his name is James Monroe Iglehart, and he now plays uh, Ben. He plays uh, Thomas Jefferson in Lafayette. And when he got into into uh, Hamilton, I'm going, "Can you get us tickets for Hamilton?" Sure, no problem. That's how we wound up seeing Hamilton. Uh, Scott Shaw says people yeah. would make a great Gravis Mushnick. Little shop of horrors. <laughs> Little shop. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mushnik's Mushnik isn't bad. I would also love to play uh, 
I would also love to be in um, in the producers. I'd, I'd love, I'd love, I'd love to play the, the the lead role in that. That would be fantastic. Um, yeah, Mush, Mushnik would be interesting. And in the, in the original musical, he actually had the song Mushnik and Sons. Yeah, so it's, that would it's, be well, fun. it's in the stage version. It's, it's yes, it's not the movie. It's not, it's not in the, it's not in the film version. No, no, but it's a it's a good song. I yeah. saw I saw um, you know I saw do uh, Little Shop of Horrors play Bushnick, Jesse White. Remember Jesse really? White? Yes, he was wonderful in the role. Interesting. And then, and then years later, I I was working with Dom DeLuise on a project, oh, and I yeah. saw him do it, and he was terrible because oh, he was yeah. too he was too sweet. He was just you couldn't. Dom DeLuise can could play anything except a bad guy. He just, oh, he just Jesus. you know, he was just too 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 nice for the too nice part. guy, I believe yeah, it. Yeah, but uh um anyway, there's some good shows there. There's some good things here. We're gonna we're gonna uh, wind this down here in a minute. Um Peter, what are you working on these days? That or is there something coming out soon that people should look for? Well, let's see. Um I'm writing another um Symbiote Spider Man limited series. Which I'm excited about. Also, I'm writing a five issue Maestro limited series, which surprised the hell out of me. Marvel contacted me and they said, Would you be interested in doing a Maestro limited series? We'd actually be interested. You, you could set it at any time in its timeline, but we'd be kind of interested in a prequel to Future Imperfect. And I said, Sure. And, uh, that, and that's been coming out great. I'm very, very excited about that. So those are the comic projects I'm working on at the moment. I also have some other things that I'm working on. Um, I'm I'm writing a, a kind of sideways sequel to Sir Apropos of Nothing called Schlepper the Leper, which may be my favorite title of a, of a novel I've ever come up with. Um, I'm also I've also just finished putting together a short story collection called The Right Stuff, W R I T E, uh, which Hopefully, I will be able to sell to somebody, so that would be nice. Um, and also, we are working on doing a feature film of Fallen Angel, which I'm very excited about. So, you know, hopefully, I'll be able to do a, tell you more about that. That's going to be produced by David Eustlin, whose father is Michael Eustlin, who produced the Batman films. Okay, very good. That's nice. Well, Peter, thank you for staying up past your bedtime. <laughs> to uh, yeah, to I used work. I used to be a night person. It used to be that I would work till like two, three in the morning. Now, generally by eleven o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I'm like, oh. okay. Let me just tell people who are watching this that um, I'm doing these every Tuesday. Until I run out of friends, or run out of interest, or run out of Tuesdays. We have three thousand phone numbers, so you know. <laughs> yes, yes. There's got to be there's got to be one other person who'll do this with me. Uh, and uh, uh, this coming uh, uh, Saturday, I'm doing another cartoon voice panel with a fellow named Michael Bell, who, among other things, was the voice of Plastic Man and eight million other characters you heard on Saturday morning TV. Uh, Debbie Derryberry. Uh, ah. Neil Kaplan, Neil Ross, and uh, Nikki Breyer. And then uh, two weeks after that, uh, Comic-Con is doing the, a lot of online panels on the dates when Comic-Con would have been in San Diego. And I did a panel with uh, uh, John Morrow of the Kirby Collector and Alex Ross talking about Jack Kirby, which we pre-recorded, which will be run during that time, and then it will be on my channel here. And I did a panel with uh, four great voice actors, uh, Bill Farmer, um, Dee Bradley Baker, uh, Misty Lee, and Lorraine Newman, which uh, 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 will be on there. And then I did a, I've got a couple other panels for that thing. And uh, uh, next week, on the 16th, I believe, of this month, I think it is 16th, uh, we're going to do a panel with the guys who do GRU, Sergio, Tom Luth, uh, and, uh, and uh, Stan Sakai and myself. And we'll be up here uh, in this spot talking about our work on GRU together. And uh, uh, and if you got, if you know somebody else that you want me to do one of these one-on-ones with, drop me a note. This panel will re – this interview will repeat on the same space on YouTube – almost immediately after we sign off here and it'll be up there at infinite. And if you want to catch the parts you missed uh, at some point 
And uh, thank you, Peter. I've enjoyed this tremendously. Good. And, you uh, do. We will do this again maybe sometime and I, after I go through all my other friends and come back <laughs> around the second time. A uh, week after next, I think I'm doing Kurt Busick. We're going to do another Excellent. talk here about my regards. Uh, stuff. And coming up, we've got Jeff Altman and we've got uh, some other interesting people. Some people you may not know that I know. Uh, okay. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing that. And um, as I said, that's it. Uh, we will sign off now. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Peter. Stay where you are, Peter, while I get us off the air. Okay. Thanks. Bye.